Well, thank you uh, for inviting me and giving the opportunity to share some um, thinking in practice. Uh, I, I have been since 2006 sort of developing ideas from on the move um, about the politics of mobility. And in 2010, uh, wrote a paper about sort of suggesting ways forward towards a, po a politics of mobility. And given that we, we like to write the word towards often at the beginning of our subtitles, I thought it would be good to make some movement towards it and actually stop using towards and just write the politics of mobility. So, so this is um, this presentation is part of that project, really. I mean, I've, I've done things on friction and some other things, and rhythm is the thing I'm working on at the moment, and it's sort of thought in progress. Um, it isn't it isn't exactly notes; it's more than notes, but it isn't finished in the uh, way I would sometimes like to present. Um, it's it's this opportunity though has allowed me to think about rhythm for the last two or three weeks quite intensely to come up with what I came up with today. So thanks for the opportunity. Um, so, so as I said, I want to think with you about the concept of rhythm as part of a wider project concerning the politics of mobility. You probably don't need me to tell you given the, the, the series of talks and the, the topic of them, but mobility has become a key concept across the humanities, social sciences and arts, thanks to the advent of what has been called the new mobilities paradigm or mobilities turn around the turn of the century. Mobility theory starts from the recognition that mobility had previously appeared as logically, morally and politically secondary to concerns that emphasized versions of fixity, boundedness, and rootedness. The anthropologist Lisa Malky referred to this as a sedentary metaphysics, a set of beliefs that prioritize rooted, bounded, and relatively fixed spaces in a way that made mo mobility conceptually, morally, and politically suspect. Similar beliefs were identified by scholars such as John Uri and Mimi Scheller, as being widespread across disciplines. They asked instead what happens when we start, start with mobility in our thoughts rather than making it secondary to the arrangements of spaces and places. What if we take mobility seriously? I realize this still doesn't explain what we mean by mobility and I will give you my own take on this which is similar to but not exactly the same as other scholars from within the mobility turn. And I apologize if anyone in the audience was in my um, uh, Citizens and Vagabond talk recently in Zurich because the first sort of three or four minutes of this are exactly the same. Um, uh, it, wasn't occur it didn't occur to me at the time you might be the same people. So um, my take on mobility insists in line with Henri Lefebvre um, that mobility is a social product. It includes three aspects that are almost always interrelated and never exist in a pure form. Movement, meaning and practice. Movement refers to physical movement between locations. Like Lefebvre's representations of space, this refers to the dominant view of planners, governments and transport operators. It's usually quantifiable and often as it is here mapped. It's the lines and arrows that appear on maps to denote the size, frequency, speed and direction of flows uh, and uh, flows of people, things, and ideas. Meaning straightforwardly recognizes that movements are culturally and socially encoded. The lines on the map are never all there is. These lines are filled with, filled with significance. Travel and journeys from the daily commute to the heights of the North Pole are meaningful parts of a more than human life. This is exactly why journeys form the basis of so many of our stories, from epic poems to modern novels, from the Odyssey to Ulysses. Mobile practice is the third element of mobility. Similar to Lefebvre's spatial practice, this recognizes that what we do mobility in both mundane and extraordinary ways, we walk, we drive, we sail, we fly, we crawl, we swagger, we march. How we do mobility then makes a difference. And these differences cannot be conveyed by technocratic plans that only ever really convey movement. So these then are three aspects of fully socialized and fully cultural notion of mobility. 
Mobility includes movement, but also exceeds it. And the relationship between movement and mobility is not unlike the difference between location and place. The dot, the dot on the map that marks location is transformed once we know that the place is Vienna or Edinburgh. Mobility is to movement as place is to location. <coughs> the next step in my development of the idea of mobility is to recognize that it's totally wrapped up in power and politics. This is true of movement. The lines and arrows on maps reflect established patterns of power, where we can go, how often we go, how fast we go, what direction we go in. All these are dependent on who we are and how we are positioned in distributions of power. Movement like space is both an outcome of power and a tool in its production, reproduction and potential transformation. Meaning too is saturated with power. Car ads sell us sex and prestige. Road movies convince us of the power of mobility as rebellion. We are convinced that mobility is about modernity or progress, or alternatively, it's about the forces that threaten to undo these things. A lot depends on what meanings mobility is given and who it is that authorizes these meanings. Finally, practice is political. How we move tells us a lot about who we are in relation to systematically asymmetrical relations of power. Do we travel easily through the streets of the city or are we frequently stopped, whether walking or driving? These questions are entangled, of course, with race. Do we travel first class or in economy? Do we drive or take the bus? Do we flow unimpeded through the airport or do we embark on a boat that is barely seaworthy to cross the Mediterranean or the English Channel? So this then is the basis of an approach to mobility. Mobility is movement plus meaning plus power, practice in the context of power. When considering the politics of mobility, however, we need to recognize that mobility includes within it several facets uh, or themes that I have argued elsewhere need to be explored separately. These include, among, among other things, velocity, direction, route, distance, friction, and rhythm. And I'm currently working on developing each of these facets into a theorization of the politics of mobility. And it is the facet of rhythm that I want to explore with you today. I want to use the time I have left to ask what rhythm is, explore some of the approaches to rhythm that have proved most fruitful, and consider what role rhythm plays in power and politics. I'll do so with reference to three moments in the history of rhythm from music, movies, and sport, each of which points towards how we might theorize the role of rhythm as an aspect of mobility in the, in the wider world. <coughs> So rhythm has long been used to think about the ways mobility is related to place. A concern with rhythm adds dynamism to place. It makes us think about the ways places are made and remade minute by minute, hour by hour, and day by day. David Seaman, for instance, described how people perform time-space routines as they make their way through days, and how these time-space routines add up to place ballets a combination of physical environment and the regular movements of people creating a varying tempo of movement and stasis as bodies move, rest and encounter each other. More recently, geographers have sought to explore urban spaces in particular through their rhythmic choreographies. Choreographies which help to unfix place from a sometimes overly static framework of rootedness and boundedness. Such work shows how mobility is not the enemy of place, but rather part of what makes a place what it is. It reveals what Anne Buttimer called the dynamism of the life world. So here's, here's Anne, um, this is from, from her paper. To record behavior in an isometric grid, as in movement, representing space and time is only an opening onto the horizons of lived space and time. Neither geodesic space nor clock calendar time is appropriate for the measurement of experience. The notion of rhythm may offer a beginning step towards such a measure. Life world experience could be described as the orchestration of various time space rhythms. Those are the physiological and cultural dimensions of life 
those of different work styles, those of our physical and functional environments. On a macro level, one is dealing with the synchronizations of movement of various scales, taking a sounding, as it were, at the particular point where our new experience has prodded us to explore. Fatima's plea for attention to rhythm is broadly conceived. It's not just human rhythms she's asking us to consider, but the rhythms of uh, the biological environment too. An understanding of rhythm means um, paying attention to experience as much as it does tra to tracing bodies through abstract notions of space. This sense of a rhythmic place mobility nexus has more recently been conveyed by Tim Edenzor. Consider these routines, daily flows of people through space and place, the walking patterns of shop children, the rush hour of commuters, the surge of shoppers, the throngs of evening clubbers, the rituals of housework, the lifestyles of students, the slow pace of unemployment, the timed compulsions of drug addicts and alcoholics, and the timetabled activities of tourists, to name a few. Consider the openings and closings of shops, the flow of postal deliveries, bank deposits, and coffee breaks, as well as the schedules of public transport, pub hours and lighting up times, and the different rhythms of the night and day, as well as seasonal and annual cycles, which bestow a temporal sense of place. In music, rhythm is created by changing arrangements of sounds and silences of varying duration. Rhythm includes within it several other terms that are helpful in thinking about a more fully developed theorization of rhythm, such as duration, pulse, tempo, and meter. Duration refers to the length of individual notes. Pulse is another name for beat. It refers to regular units of time that underpin a rhythm. The speed of a pulse is a tempo. Meter refers to a time signature or how beats are divided into groups. While these all have precise meanings in the world of music, they might help us think ryth rhythmically about society. With that in mind, let's turn to our first moment in the history of rhythm. And here's gonna be some um, sound, some music, and I'm gonna talk as well. So hopefully you can hear both at the same time. And if someone wants me to stop talking um, for a brief period, I can do that too. One of the most transformational moments in the history of music was the first performance of Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring in Paris on the 29th of May, 1913. The audience was scandalized by both the music that put rhythm on the same footing as melody and the dancing of Václav Nijinsky and the Ballet Russe. There are stories of things being thrown at the stage, of the police being called, of someone being challenged to a duel. Stravinsky based the music on folk traditions that made them completely modern. The percussion section, and particularly the timpani and brass drum, are given an unheard of prominence for orchestral music. They were both extremely loud and harsh and played in unexpected ways. At one point, the ritual of the rival tribes, which is what you're listening to, the music plays at two rhythms at the same time, at a ratio of three to two. T.S. Eliot wrote admiringly that the music transformed the rhythm of the steps into the scream of the motor horn, the rattle of machinery, the grind of wheels, the beating of iron and steel, the roar of the underground railway, and the other barbaric cries of modern life, and to transform these despairing noises into music. It was this combination of rhythm and volume that Eliot so admired that scandalized the audience and other less generous critics. Clearly rhythm was a core component of all music up to the Rite of Spring, but in the classical tradition at least, it was essentially background upon which melody and harmony could unwind. It was like, it was like the taken for granted nature on which the refinements of culture could be built. Stravinsky put rhythm front and center and made it very loud. But he also played with rhythm to such an extent that the Scottish composer and critic Cecil Gray wrote 
that strip the music of the sacrificial dance, which is the last part of um, the, the Rite of Spring, of the bar lines and time signatures, which are only a loincloth concealing its shameful nudity. And it will at once be seen that there is no rhythm at all. Rhythm implies life, some kind of movement or progression at least, but this music stands quite still in a quite frightening immobility. Theodore Adorno was also not a fan. Rhythmic structure, he wrote, to be sure, is to be sure blatantly prominent, but this is achieved at the expense of all other aspects of rhythmic organization. Not only is any, subjective, any subjectively expressive flexibility of the beat absent, which is always rigidly carried out in Stravinsky from Sacra on, but furthermore, all rhythmic relations associated with the construction and the internal composition, organi compositional organization, the rhythm of the whole are absent as well. Rhythm is underscored, but split off from musical content. This results not in more, but rather in less rhythm than in compositions in which there is no fetish made of rhythm. In other words, there are only fluctuations in which there is no, in other words, there are only fluctuations of something always constant and totally static, a stepping aside in which the irregularity of recurrence replaces the new. There were, in other words, a number of reactions to the rite of spring that focused on rhythm. The first complaint was that rhythm itself was not in its appropriate place. While it should be background, it became foreground. This complaint plays on a rhythm on rhythm as a cultural signifier that's often missing from the work of geographers and urbanists on rhythm. Rhythm based as it is on repetition has been coded as primitive and lacking in any sense of progress. It has even been described as outside of history or anti-historical. Melody, on the other hand, has something like a linear sense of beginning, middle and end. Rhythm, on the other hand, always points to what goes beyond it and what precedes it, a sense of the infinite. So when the music stops, your foot can keep tapping. So when Stravinsky had, has the strings and sometimes the whole orchestra playing as one big rhythm section, it subverts the expectations of the Western cultural canon. In James Sneed's influential essay, on repetition in black culture, he remarks how the rite of spring has similarities with music in the African tradition. The Sacre du printemps, printemps, exact repetition within and across sections exceeds anything which came before it. Moreover, Stravinsky has developed the use of the cut, varying the cue giving instrument. Interestingly, both Stravinsky compositions resemble black musical forms, not just in their relentless foregrounding of rhythmic elements and their use of the cut, but also in being primarily designed for use in conjunction with dancers. This linking of rhythm with Africa and with black bodies positions rhythm and repetition as outside of and against European culture. Hegel Sneed reminds us, use this contrast to describe Africa as a historical, not progressing, but simply repeating. Hegel writes, in this main portion of Africa, there can really be no history. There is a succession of accidents and surprises. What we actually understand by Africa is that which is without history and resolution, which is still fully caught up in the natural spirit, and which, is, which here must be mentioned as being on the threshold of world history. Part of the politics of rhythm is to think about what rhythm has been made to mean in the wider sense. Rhythm has been located in the body as something carnal, as something outside of history and against progress. Rhythm has been posited as something against reason and rationality. So we have to ask what this means for our wider use of rhythm to study the more than human world. The foregrounding of rhythm, however, is only one reason the audience at the debut was so scandalized. It was not just that there was too much rhythm, but it was the wrong kind of rhythm. As T.S. Eliot notes, the writer spring fuses rhythms with origins in the folk traditions of Europe, with the rhythms of modernity, the rhythms of machines. And in this latter set of rhythms, that led some commentators such as Adorno and Gray to suggest that the piece had no rhythm at all, that it was static or nude. Stravinsky played with the expectations of meter in the piece. Western audiences are used to particular beats being accented in such a way that they are expected. 
Stravinsky defies these expectations, accenting beats as irregular and unexpected intervals. It was not only that rhythm was being foregrounded, but that the rhythms themselves played around with audience expectations in unnerving ways. 23 years after the debut of Rite of Spring, Charlie Chaplin's masterpiece, Modern Times, was released in 1936. It was to be the last time that Chaplin would pay, play his iconic character, The Little Tramp. The movie starts with a close-up of a clock with the second hand moving. We see a herd of sheep moving from the top to the bottom of the screen before cutting to workers exiting a subway and entering a large factory. As they enter, they punch the clock, registering their presence in a large hall filled with giant machinery. A muscled man pulls some levers to start the machinery, and we cut to the office of the boss, who is sitting at his chair doing a jigsaw puzzle and reading the paper. He watches scenes from the factory floor on a large screen, very prophetic kind of CCTV moment, before using the video link, or maybe a Zoom moment, um, before using the video link to tell the muscled man to speed up section five. When we cut to section five, we see Chaplin's little tramp working at a conveyor belt. He moves like the other workers around him, doing the same action, tightening some bolts with a spanner over and over at a speed dictated by the conveyor belt and ultimately by the boss in the office. At one point, the little tramp attends to his bodily needs and scratches his armpit, momentarily causing chaos at the production line before he gets back to the task demanded of him while, while being harassed by the foreman. A bee lands on the tramp's head and he swats it away, which once more interferes with the speed and rhythm of the production line. His spanners get stuck on some bolts, leading them to the machine stopping. The boss appears on the screen again to say, section five, more speed and the tramp's belt moves even faster. The tramp's work is taken up by another worker, and as the tramp moves away from the belt, his body continues to jerk mechanically to the rhythm of the machines. Before entering the toilet, the tramp clocks out so that his time attending to his body would not be paid for. He lights a cigarette in the toilets, but only till the boss appears on a screen and tells him to quit stalling and get back to work. As he leaves, he once again clocks in before taking the spanners back off his temporary replacement and continuing with his bolt tightening. The following scene follows the disaster that ensues as the boss tries out an automatic feeding machine on the tramp. Clearly the machine is designed to feed the workers while they are still working, limiting the need for a lunch break. The experiments start promisingly the boss but it goes completely wrong as the movements of the machine get out of sync with the movements of the tramp's body, leading to food ending up anywhere but in his mouth. The tramp returns to section five as the boss instructs the machine to give it the limit. The limit, it turns out, is too fast for the tramp, who ends up being sucked into the machine as he tries to desperately keep up with the regular rhythm of the machine. In one of the most famous scenes in movie, movie history, we see Chaplin's body pass through and round giant cogs and gears, briefly becoming one with the machinery and the rhythmic demands of capitalism. Once he is released from the machine, Chaplin's rhythms are transformed from those of a machine to those of a dancer, performing a ballet that completely disrupts the regular movements of production. The music changes too, from a more or less regular beat to a more romantic and varied theme suitable perhaps for classical ballet. One place we can look for an analysis of rhythm in Chaplin's movie, and indeed for an analysis of rhythm in general, is Henri Lefebvre's project of rhythm analysis. In this project, Lefebvre asks us to focus on the ways in which the world is constituted through the interactions of rhythms. As with his wider work on the production of space, he, con he, const he contrasts a perspective that's effectively structural and imposed with one that is centered on lived experience and from below. 
He focuses, in other words, on the struggle between the contrived rhythms of society and the lived rhythms derived from the body and more broadly from nature. Rhythm appears as regulated time, writes Lefebvre, governed by rational laws, but in contact with what is least rational in human being, the lived, the carnal, the body. This reminds us of T.S. Eliot's observations of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, where the rhythm of the steps is transformed into the rattle of machinery. Lefebvre plays with this tension between what appears as natural, with no, other, no law other than its own unfurling, and the measure that is constantly imposed on it. Everywhere there is rhythm, there is measure, which is to say law, calculated and expected obligation, a project. This project arises from the tension between the two kinds of rhythm. A social project of hope for transformation involves imprinting a rhythm on an era, the fair writes, be it through force or in an insinuating manner. Lefebvre refers to the process by which the external rhythm is imposed on the body as dressage, following the horse riding events where horses are trained to move in ways that they would be unlikely to move. Rhythm in this sense is broadly political. Who controls the project, the measure that comes to form common sense reality? And how does this measure come to be challenged and transformed by other rhythmic projects? So one thing we witness in the rhythms of the little tramp is the process of dressage. Lefebvre argues that what is often thought of as natural is actually something which confirms, conforms perfectly and without apparent effort to accepted models, to the habits valorized by a tradition, sometimes recent, put in force. To enter into a society, Lefebvre writes, group or nationality is to accept values that are taught to learn a trade by following the right channels, but also to bend oneself, to be bent to its ways, which means to say dressage. Humans break themselves in, say dressant, like animals. They learn to hold themselves. Dressage can go a long way as far as breathing, mo breathing movements, sex. It bases itself on repetition. One breaks in another human living being by making them repeat a certain act a certain gesture or movement. The Fair's notion of dressage certainly reflects Foucault's interest in the training and discipline of bodies in space, but also Bourdieu's theory of habitus as the social inscribed in the body. As we watch Traplin in modern times, we're watching the process of dressage, the imposition of an external rhythm onto an internal one to the point where one becomes the other, as in Bourdieu's conception of habitus. But this is not quite true. The tramp is never successfully folded into the master score of industrial capitalism. We see the constant friction caused by the needs and rhythms of capital and the needs and rhythms of the body. Chaplin scratches his arm, attempts to swat away a fly, goes to the toilet for a cigarette break, and each time the rhythm of the machines and of capital is disrupted and glitches appear as external rhythm is imposed. The attempt to feed the tramp mechanically is foiled by the recalcitrance of the body. It's not just the rhythmic microabilities of repetition on the assembly line that are at play here. There's also the, long, the longer duration rhythms of the working day, symbolized at the outset by workers streaming into the factory as the clock ticks, by Chaplin clocking in and clocking out as he goes to the toilet, by the attempt to mechanically feed the worker so that his lunch break might be curtailed. In those instances, Chaplin is illuminating the contested rhythms of the working day, outlined famously by E.P. Thompson in his reflections on time and work discipline in industrial capitalism. Rhythms exist within rhythms. The tension between the external rhythms of capital and the machine and the internal rhythms of the body eventually explode as Chaplin's body transforms from one defined by pure meter to the body of a dancer throwing the factory floor into chaos. The, vari the variable rhythm of ballet dance sabotages the nested rhythms of industry. While Lefebvre's rhythm analysis project was not fully formed and often vague, it did provide some tools to think with. He contrasts, for instance, eurythmia 
polyrhythmia and arrhythmia. Eurythmia refers to, refers to coordinated movement in time in its exaggerated form, much like a march or parade signified by the Nazi spectacles at Nuremberg or the mass events that tend to happen at the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games. Less spectacularly, it can refer to the more or less coordinated movements of traffic in the city as it ebbs and flows throughout the day. Polyrhythmia refers to coexisting diverse rhythms that nevertheless manage to form a whole. Think for this instance of the rhythms of the working day, the rhythms of the school run and the logistical rhythms of delivery, all existing at the same time in a city space. Arrhythmia refers to discordant rhythms that may eventually, eventually lead to breakdown and transformation. This might refer to the rhythms of protest in the city or the challenges produced by the breakdown of normally taken for granted infrastructure or perhaps the sudden arrival of a global pandemic. It might refer also to the clash of the little tramp's bodily rhythms and the imposed rhythms of the machine. Less well known than Lefebvre's account of rhythm analysis is Roland Barthes' uh, concept of idiorhythmy, an idea expanded on in his lectures at the Collège de France not long before his death and published in cryptic note form, in English at least, in 2013 in the, in the book How to Live Together. Unlike Lefebvre, Barthes is not immediately concerned with society as a whole, but rather with sport, small monastic communities, micro utopias that exist outside of mainstream society. This is where the term idiorhythmy comes from, the Greek idios meaning particular and rhythmos meaning rule. Idiorhythmic monasticism thus means living by one's own rules. More expensively, the idea points towards the idea of community or perhaps society where each could live according to their own rhythms rather than succumbing to dominant or established rhythms formulated through law. Just as Lefebvre illustrates his conception of rhythm analysis through describing a scene from a window above a square in Paris, so Barthes illustrates the politics of rhythm by looking down at the street below. From my window, December the 1st, 1976, I see a mother pushing an empty stroller holding a child in the hand. She walks at her own pace, imperturbably. The child, meanwhile, is being pulled, dragged along, is forced to keep running like an animal or one of Said's victims being whipped. She walks at her own pace, unaware of the fact that her son's rhythm is different. And she's his mother, power, the subtlety of power is affected through dysrhythmy, heterorhythmy, so very similar concepts to Lefebvre. Like, Le, like Lefebvre, he insists on the foundational role of rhythm in the operations of power. Before anything else, the first thing that power imposes is rhythm to everything, a rhythm of life, of time, of thought, of speech. The demand for idiorhythmy is always made in opposition to power, rhythmos, a rhythm that allows for approximation, an imperfection, for a supplement, a lack, an idios, what doesn't fit the structure or would have to be made to fit. Barthes insists on the necessity of separating the general notion of rhythm from the idea of meter, separating a general idea of a regular ordered sequence of movements and rests and replacing it with a particular way of flowing. While rhythm as meter brings with it the sense of regularity and calculation, the fuller sense of rhythm is both varied and lived. If we return to modern times, the rest of the film beyond the first 15 minutes illustrates this play on rhythms as the tramp and his partner in crime, the gamin, try to carve out a life outside of the structures of both factory and institutions such as an insane asylum and the prison. These moments of possible autonomy include scenes of real and imagined domesticity and the final shot of the tramp and the gammon taking to the road for some undefined future. Here, there are momentarily at least different rhythms which are neither part of nor rubbing against dominant ones. These moments are perhaps moments of idiorhythmy. So now let us turn to the final moment in history of rhythm. In 1969, the Black University of Houston rece wide receiver, Elmo Wright, 
engaged in an unusual high-stepping routine as he entered the end zone to score a touchdown during an American football match. He would later export this routine to the National Football League, where he played with the Kansas City Chiefs, and thus the touchdown celebration was born. For a while, such celebrations were left untouched, but by the mid-1970s, the NFL had engaged in a long-standing struggle to police and penalize touchdown celebrations. So Rule 12, uh, Section 3, Article 1 of the National Football League NFL rules concerns unsportsmanlike player conduct. The section on taunting reads, the use of baiting or taunting acts or words that engender ill will between teams, individual players involved in prolonged or excessive celebrations, players are prohibited from engaging in any celebrations while on the ground. A celebration shall be deemed excessive or prolonged if a player continues to celebrate after a warning from an official. Two or more players engage in prolonged, excessive, premeditated or choreographed celebrations or possession or use of a foreign or extraneous objects that are not part of the uniform during the game on the field, on the sideline or using the ball as a prop. This set of rules, which led some to suggest that NFL stood for no fun league are a response to decades, uh, a decades old practice of touchdown celebrations introduced by and for the most part conducted by black football players. Since the 1970s, players have been inventing various ways of celebrating the fact they've just scored a touchdown, some of which uh, involve physical gestures and forms of dance. Business is still booming. Antonio Brown is coming off the best season of his career. He led the league in receptions last season and started the conversation that he may be the best wideout in the league. Antonio started his first NFL game of the 2016 season with two touchdowns. Strong. One of which he celebrated with a twerk. celebration was short-lived though because he was quickly given a 15-yard penalty. Oh come on, he's just trying to show us what he learned from dancing with the stars this summer. But the NFL bylaws specifically ban sexually suggestive on-field celebrations. All right, the twerk memes are rolling in. Here's a pic of Antonio twerking on stage with Beyonce and all of her backup dancers. This isn't the first outrageous celebration we've seen from Brown. Remember when he did a freaking flip into the end zone last season? All right, the Steelers pretty much stayed in control for the entire game. And the NFL has spent a disproportionate amount of effort deciding on which of these celebrations should be banned. If a player is involved in a banned celebration, the opposition team, as we've just seen, is awarded a 15-yard penalty at the resumption of play. In some cases, players have been fined. Almost without exception, these end zone celebrations have been invented by... <coughs> excuse me and enacted by black football players who constitute around 70% of professional football players. The vast majority of those who have sought to ban these celebrations, that is coaches and NFL officials, are white. This led Joel Dinnerstein to suggest that white head coaches and others were threatened by forms of black behavior they deemed powerless to control. How else to assess the illegal celebration penalties of the 1980s, he writes, except as the illegal use of black culture. Various commentators have described the embodied mobilities of black athletes in terms that verge on essentialist. We do not have to resort to essentialist versions of black mobilities, however, to recognize historically specific circuits of black body culture originating in Africa and transformed in the process of transatlantic migration and circulation. Dinnerstein writes, sudden turns, swift changes of place, the jazz practice of improvisation within set patterns, opening up pathways for self-expression to make any game swing. All these aesthetic elements were present in the open field running style of African-American running backs and wide receivers as they began to dominate college and pro football offenses after the civil rights movement helped end gridiron segregation. Observations such as these 
led Joel Dinnerstein to argue that for better or worse, the most admired and imitated human body in motion in global popular culture is the African-American male body in sports, music, and dance. Yet few cultural critics find such a social fact worthy of analysis. Touchdown dances, he argued, threatened traditional versions of white masculinity with what appeared to be excessive emotion, feminized bodily movements, and a degree of self-expression that appeared to work against regimented versions of teamwork that American football had been built on. Um, so um, Paul Christensen writes, again, for American African-American athletes, music, dance, self-expression, dynamic physical gesture, and signature athletic style exist on a cultural continuum, not as separate realms of performance. It would still be unusual to see a Euro-American football player after scoring a touchdown, spin the ball away slowly on the ground, then wiggle his ass to celebrate his achievements, then hip shake his lower torso right and then left while walking away, and often enough have some of his teammates join him in the dance. This is contrasted with the military industrial emphasis on hierarchy and regimentation developed by the father of American football, William Camp, in his insistence on team discipline and highly organized patterns of play. Paul Christensen has noted how as Camp influenced the evolving structure of the game, athletes came to be viewed merely as cogs in an organized human machine, doing what industrial manager Camp liked to call the work of football. Note how this reflects the tensions between machine rhythms and body rhythms in Chaplin's movie, the labeling of particular bodily gestures as unsportsmanlike by the NFL is mobilized against black bodies. Herbert Simmons puts it succinctly. These behaviors, sorry, I haven't got a slide for this. These behaviors are a reflection of urban African-American male cultural norms, which conflict with white male mainstream norms. The penalties are an example of institutionalized racism and white mainstream's males' assertion of their right to interpret and control African-American behavior. Pleasure has also been a product of the interlacing of black mobilities connected, connecting the transatlantic mobilities of slavery to the bodily mobilities of music and dance that have traveled across far wider global circuits. It's possible, as Ananya Kabir has noted, to excavate a history that connects the ship, the jet engine, and the beats of the drum. Kabir historicizes Afro-diasporic rhythm cultures through the various routes and sites that trace the traffic between trauma and pleasure. Indeed, there's been a long-standing effort to recover positive mobilities from the catastrophic mobilities of, of slavery. African rhythms have been one of the sites that scholars have looked towards in order to enact the recovery in explorations of the, American, of the Americas at large, and particularly the Caribbean. A syncopation and polyrhythms of music and dance rooted in Africa and transformed in the process of transatlantic travel became the basis for Paul Gilroy's reconfiguration of the Black Atlantic. But then there's also this other history of Black rhythms as an iterative catastrophe enacted over and over in sites ranging from the football field to the streets of American cities. Black rhythms have been sites of pleasure and resistance, but have at the same time been sites constitutive of repeated oppression and negation. Another way of thinking about the links between race and rhythm is given by Clyde Woods in his book, Development Arrested. Woods contrasts the spatial order based on the plantation with its own rhythms, with an epistemology rooted in the blues. The blues, Woods argues, grew out of the experience of enslaved black people forced to work on these plantations, but able nonetheless to produce their own ways of knowing and being rooted in oral tradition. Woods reflects on the literature of the blues as a political form of black culture with origins in Africa that were formed in the experience of slavery. Wood cites the musicologist and performer, Ben Sidron, who underlines the way rhythm is part of a wider culture linking music, language, and movement. Sidron writes, the essential nature of communication through rhythm is an unknown quantity due primarily to a lack of interest on the part of Western science. Rhythm is the cultural catharsis that Fanon has suggested is necessary to black culture. It simultaneously asserts and preserves the oral ontology is on this basis that black music can be seen as a source for black social organization. As Sidron notes, Franz Fanon in The Wretched of the Earth 
repeatedly writes of power in terms of rhythm. White colonialism is described as an imposed rhythm, while de decolonization brings a new rhythm. Fanon writes, decolonization never takes place unnoticed, for it influences individuals and modifies them fundamentally. It transforms spectators crushed with their inessentiality into privileged actors with the grandiose glare of history's floodlights upon them. It brings a natural rhythm into existence introduced by new men and with it a new language and a new humanity. Decolonization is the veritable creation of new men. In her collection of essays and interventions, Dear Science and other stories, Catherine McKittrick draws on the work of Sylvia Winter to consider the radical potential of rhythm configured by McKittrick as groove for black radical theory and practice. In Black Metamorphosis, Winter writes that rhythm is the aesthetic ethic principle of gestalt and thus central to the constitution of black life. As McKittrick writes, Black music waveforms allow us to glean the re that reinventing black life anew is bound up in cognitive schemas that envision and feel black sound outside normative structures of desire. This is to say that in order to be newly human, one does not only rebelliously cite and make black cultural interventions, but sounds and ideas and texts deeply and enthusiastically in order to affirm humanity, one grooves out of the logic of racism and into black life. So I've used three moments in the history of rhythms, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, Chaplin's Modern Times and the National Football League's Touchdown Celebration Rules to illuminate some elements of a politics of rhythm that are themselves components of a larger politics of mobility. This exploration has included reflection on the general place of rhythm in white Western thought, the way external and internal rhythms can come into conflict and the specific connections between rhythms and race and particularly blackness. Rhythm is both part of the imposition of the social into and onto the body and a form of resistance to this imposition, a source of improvisational joy. My hope is that the lesson here can be applied to the wider world of mobilities at scales ranging from the micro mobilities of bodies to global travel including the worlds of transport and migration. I also suspect that the idea of intersectional rhythm analysis suggested by the geographer Emily Reed Musson has much to offer. Lefebvre's account of rhythm analysis doesn't linger on forms of embodied social difference. His world is one of fairly universal people who are neither marching in step with an established measure, sorry, are either marching in step with an established measure or living arrhythmically and producing disturbances in systems of mobility. Nothing is said about how gender or race or sexuality or age increase the likelihood of being arrhythmic. Recent work on rhythm have begun to fill these quite general observations with social and cultural content, including the clashes between the slower rhythms of the retired and elderly and the dominant rhythms of the young the arrhythmia and the ongoing challenges that come with having drivers and cyclists on the same road, a road designed largely with drivers in mind. Justin Spinney has shown how cyclists perform interruptions of the dominant rhythms of the city streets, going when they should stop, weaving when they should be stationary and using spaces inappropriately. What I, what I hope is we can move towards a theorization of rhythm as part of a more general outline of a politics of mobility a theorization that might help us to add depth and complexity to Anne Buttermer's call that we grasp the dynamism of the life world. Thank you.